five, four, three, two, one, zero. Ignition. Lift off of the Falcon 9 and Crew Dragon. Go NASA. Go SpaceX. Over the past 200 years, humanity has become the dominant force in shaping the face of our planet. This year, 2020, marks a crossover year, when the anthropomass, the mass embodied in the built environment, which includes concrete, metals, bricks and glass, will exceed the biomass on our planet, which includes trees, plants, animals, bacteria, fungi and viruses. Current building technologies and material practices are its main culprits, propelling us to an inevitable future where we're called upon to build shelter against ourselves. As we project 200 years ahead, what are the values, principles, knowledge, skills that we must cultivate as we architect a future of synergy between the natural and the built environment? A skyscraper is not a tree. Not yet. Since our divorce from nature with the Industrial Revolution, the major challenge for architecture remains a challenge of language as we replace units of growth with units of construction. For centuries, we've been taught to sketch, model, and build in three static dimensions, X, Y, and Z. But the natural world offers contexts that are much more dimensionally complex and dynamic. They include environmental dimensions, such as heat, light, and humidity, and epidemiological dimensions associated with viral load, influencing urban immunity. When we're able to communicate in nature's language, when we're able to transcend the view that nature is a boundless entity, even transcending the building as the kernel of the architectural project, per the Bauhaus tradition, when we invite scientific inquiry and technological innovation, fusing atoms with bits and bits with genes, only then will the art of building enable new forms of interaction between humans and their environment. Only then will we be able to design, construct, and evolve as equals. In the past few years, for the first time in architectural history, we're approaching the resolution and complexity of the natural world by creating new technologies that will ultimately enable us to design a beam as if it were a branch, or an HVAC and waste removal system as if it were a photosynthetic GI tract engineered to convert carbon into biofuel. This is the precision medicine moment of architectural design and it is a growing moment. Imagine that nature is the single most important client in your architectural practice. What are the values and principles at the core of such a project? First, technology over typology. Technology has the power to either improve or entirely reinvent the typology it was devised to serve. Additive manufacturing of glass, for example, enables the creation of architectural scale optical lenses, offering a glimpse into the design and construction of solar powered and energy harvesting building materials. Decay over disposal. We emphasize decay over disposal, whereby decay is designed by orienting biomaterials to programmatically biodegrade and rejoin an ecosystem for purposes of fueling new growth. Multi-species over mono-species. With continued deforestation of the rainforests, humans cut down nearly 15 billion trees per year, it will degrade into a dry savanna. Can we design, not cut trees? Can we apply the same ethical code to fiber-producing, cotton-producing organisms and honey-producing pollinators? Heterogeneity over homogeneity. We need to design materials that can restore or rewild biodiversity on the planet. When ecosystems are more diverse, they are better able to perform essential ecosystem services, like carbon sequestration. 
system over object. Finally, in a post-pandemic world facing the perils of climate change, we must consider the building not as an object, but as a collaborative system tightly linked to its natural environment, an ecological niche. So here are five demonstrations of the principles presented, including the technologies we've engineered to design and construct them. Consider them not as five points for a new architecture, but perhaps as five tenants for a new ecology. They include glass, polymers, fibers, pigments, and cellular solids. Optically transparent, structurally sound, and chemically inert, glass is a fabulous building material and has been for over 4,000 years. Still, the production and use of hundreds of billions of glass facade components every year in the U.S. alone begs the question, what if we can utilize this immense surface area for harvesting solar energy in efficient and effective ways? The 3D printing of optically transparent glass points towards such a possible future. Unlike blowing or forming glass, resulting in smooth and continuous surfaces, the printing of glass enables high levels of control over shape and optical properties. Here's one example. When the nozzle releasing a stream of molten glass is raised above a certain level, the glass thread begins to wobble or autocoil. It traces out waves or loops, which can be controlled by adjusting the speed of the nozzle. If the dribbling of the glass outstrips the forward motion of the nozzle, the thread will trace out a meandering wavy line instead of a straight one. Based on how fast the glass is falling or a given height, we can predict the glass pattern and its structure. As a result, we can predict its optical properties. This simple ratio, height and speed, can produce a wide variety of shapes. Those shapes then become the building blocks for intricate three-dimensional structures that can function as giant optical lenses. We are currently at work on designing channels and pockets within those lenses as we explore the possibility of harvesting solar energy through them. Another unique feature associated with the lensing effect is the ability to reverse engineer shadow detection and behavior. In other words, we can generate shapes based on the shadow footprints we wish to optimize for. The printing platform is based on a dual heated chamber. The upper chamber acts as a kiln cartridge, while the lower chamber serves to anneal the structure. The kiln cartridge operates at approximately 1900 Fahrenheit and can contain sufficient material to build a single architectural component. We've additionally designed a rotary table which embodies an infinite rotation capability about the Z-axis, providing a fourth degree of freedom. Like a molten calligraphy pen, it enables control over internal geometrical features. Utilizing this technology, we're able to print full-scale columns with integrated lighting, generating a large caustic footprint. The caustics is the sum of light rays reflected and refracted through the curved surface of the printed column over the surrounding floor and wall areas. Given their geometrical complexity and dynamic optical properties, the columns act as architectural scale lenses that can concentrate or disperse light from within and or outside the glass surface. Now reimagine Santo Pompidou without any functional or formal partitions of systems. Instead, consider a single and continuous transparent building skin made of glass that can integrate multiple functions and can be shaped to tune its structural and its environmental performance. Not unlike the human skin, which serves at once as barrier and as filter. This five meter tall structure is more or less 80% water straight off the robot. The rest is about 20% trees, apple skins, and shrimp shells. To speak in nature's language, 
we must prioritize bio-based structural materials, biopolymers. Biopolymers are natural polymers produced by the cells of living organisms. We're already utilizing them in products, pharma, even in fashion. But to deploy them on the architectural scale, we need to invest in design and construction technologies that emulate their hierarchical properties by engineering real-time chemical formation. From a limited palette of molecular components, including cellulose, chitin, and pectin, the very same materials found in trees, crustaceans, and apple skins, natural systems embody an extensive array of functional materials that outperform human engineered ones through their resilience, sustainability, and adaptability. If we can scale structural function relationships found in trees and crustaceans, call it parametric chemistry, we will be able to architect buildings, including full-scale towers, as living structures able to adapt and respond to their environment. With over 300 million tons of plastic produced globally each year, less than 10% of it recycled, there is a real need for alternatives. The Agua Hoja collection, with two pavilions, aims to subvert the toxic waste cycle through the creation of biopolymer composites with tunable mechanical and optical properties. These renewable biocompatible polymers leverage the power of natural resource cycles and can also be made to decay as they return to the earth for purposes of fueling new growth. A tree becomes a tower, a tower regrows a tree. The robotic platform we designed to enable this process includes a robotic arm, a mixing chamber, and a differentiated fan array. Both shape and material composition can be directly informed by desired physical properties such as stiffness and opacity, environmental conditions such as low temperature and relative humidity, and robotic fabrication constraints such as degree of freedom, arm speed, and nozzle pressure. Each structure in the collection contains a unique combination of organic materials whose location, texture, and distribution are data-driven and additively manufactured in high spatial resolution. In contrast to most synthetic materials, structures included in this collection will react to their environment over their lifespan, adapting their shape, their mechanical behavior, and even their color in response to fluctuations in heat, humidity, and sunlight. Standing five meters tall, Agohoja is a mini tower composed of the most abundant biopolymers on our planet. Its layered structure, known as a biocomposite, is designed as a hierarchical network of patterns optimized for structural stability, flexibility, and visual connectivity. Combining shell-like and skin-like elements, the pavilion's overall stiffness and strength are designed to withstand changing environmental conditions such as heat and humidity while retaining its flexibility. Over time, with the evaporation of water, the pavilion skin and shell composite transitions from a flexible and relatively weak system to a rigid one that can respond to heat and to humidity. Upon exposure to rainwater, the pavilion skin and shell, made of about 5,000 fallen leaves, 6,000 apple skins, and 3,000 shrimp shells, will dissociate programmatically, restoring their constituent building blocks to the existing ecosystem. Through life and programmed decomposition, shelter becomes organism, and organism becomes shelter, as it holds the potential to promote the health of natural resource cycles by such means as promoting soil microorganisms and providing nutrients for growing buildings. We often neglect to appreciate the sheer quantity of plant and animal-derived materials processed and consumed by our industry. Timber, resin, rubber, linen, dyes, silk, and a wide array of fibers offer but a brief reminder of their use and mishandling. With over 1,000 silk cocoons boiled in the production of a single t-shirt, we ask can we extract silk without exterminating cocoons? What are the technological, architectural, and ethical implications for sericulture, architectural construction, for bi-digital design? How might we invent technologies to enable co-design, co-manufacturing, and even cohabitation 
What are the ways by which we can reorient architecture to consider materials not as consumables, but as outputs of valuable and increasingly scarce ecological niches? In our most recent project, Silk Pavilion 2, we were reunited with our good friends, the silkworms, to provide answers to some of these questions culminating in the co-creation of a six-meter-tall fiber structure made almost entirely of silk. Two discoveries were key to this project. The first was that in the absence of a vertical post, a branch, silkworms will spin flat silk sheets. The second was that the distribution of silkworms, and thereby the organization and the density of fiber per a given surface, is directly linked to environmental conditions such as gravity, heat, and light. In order to spin an architectural scale, we designed a positioning mandrel in the form of a cylindrical kinetic jig placed between two wheel-like elements. Over 10 days and 15,000 clockwise rotations, we were able to achieve a more or less homogeneous spread of fibers across the entire surface area of the structure. Rather than boiling the cocoons, as often is the case in the silk industry, our process enabled the silkworm's healthy metamorphosis during spinning, and not a single silkworm was exterminated in the pavilion's construction. The pavilion's primary structure and the soluble knit scaffold were stretched utilizing a cable system, with the intermediate knit yarn providing support for the silkworms. The holes, which ended up releasing some of the tensile stress in the structure, resulted from chemical reactions between the silkworms' excretions and the underlying yarn. These structural forces are influenced biochemically, expressing a metabolic footprint of the silkworms' internal material expressions. Ten days of co-creation among silkworms, humans, and a giant robotic loom resulted in a structure made of silk threads with over 17,000 participating caterpillars soared from Tuolo, Italy, one of the most extensive silkworm rearing facilities in Europe. In this region of Veneto, the tradition of sericulture and silk manufacturing blossomed during 12th century Renaissance. Combined, the length of silk spun amounts to the length of twice the Great Wall of China, or the distance from New York to Minnesota, or the diameter of our planet. It is a fine example of how these small yet unique insects can act as architects. And a reminder that the planet and the animal kingdom can no longer offer infinite material yields but a delicate kingdom rarity begging to be mothered and architected with dignity. With biodiversity on planet Earth under momentous threat, an extinction rate estimated at between 100 and 1,000 times their pre-human levels, architects are now on the look for materials and substances that can enhance biodiversity and rewild living systems. One such substance, known to sustain and augment the diversity of wildlife at the genetic, species, and ecosystem levels, is melanin. It is a naturally occurring chemical chain that gives all living things across all kingdoms their color. A biomarker of evolution, melanin is the color of life. The substance that defines the color of skin, hair, and eyes is both ancient and modern. It is found in dinosaur fossils and today can be chemically synthesized at the lab. It is one of the most resistant, heterogeneous, and pervasive pigments found on our planet. It is the bricks and mortar of the natural world. Without it, we're toast. In addition to its critical role in providing protection from UV radiation, it serves a wide variety of functions, including mechanical protection, energy harvesting, cell growth, and thermal regulation in all living organisms. Melanin represents unity in the diversity of life on Earth and is clearly linked to biological survival throughout the ages. It is key to human survival on Earth. This project addresses and speculates upon architects' ability to chemically synthesize this pigment of life as a functional material, 
enabling the generation of materials and structures designed to interact, adapt, and respond to the natural environment. Melanine can be synthesized through a reaction between an enzyme found in mushrooms called tyrosinase and a protein building block called L-tyrosine. The pigment can be extracted from mycelium, bird feathers, cuttlefish ink, pigeons, quails, whales, your own hair even, then purified and filtered in a series of steps. The genes for melanine production can also be engineered into bacterial species such as E. coli, enabling high levels of control over texture and response to changes in the environment. For instance, its coloration could deepen as the sun reaches its peak providing protection from solar radiation. Over the past year, we've developed methods for the design of structures that can contain biological substances across scales, from micro to macro, and also across phases, from solids to liquids. As part of the basic research behind this project, TOTEMS, we've created a series of structures featuring a single connected channel filled with liquid melanine. These structures display a wide range of colors and absorption spectra, from light yellow to dark brown. The channels have been computationally grown, 3D printed, and biologically augmented to create pockets for the liquid melanine to reside in, with channel diameters ranging from millimeters to centimeters. An installation designed for the exhibition Broken Nature features melanine production on an architectural scale for deployment in a specific environmental context. Each column is initiated with the introduction of tyrosinase, an enzyme that is light sensitive, leading to color formation that continues over the span of a day, deepening as as the sun reaches its zenith and easing into lighter hues as the sun sets. These melanine-infused columns function as biological windows designed to provide protection from, connection to, and transformation of sunlight. We've translated this research into the built environment through an architectural proposal for Design and Daba endorsed by the Mandela Foundation. This environmentally responsive, melanine-infused glass structure is designed to contain multiple types of melanine obtained in Cape Town. It provides UV protection during the day and stargazing at night. How is it possible, we asked, that the very same material that brought us together over millions of years across all kingdoms of life is tearing us apart? Through this investigation, we question our ongoing relationship with biology, ecology, and natural history. Now back to space. We've so far examined four case studies with the bespoke technologies invented to design them. Glass, biopolymers, fibers, and pigments. As you've noticed, the units of life, despite their complexity and sophistication, are tiny compared with the scale of concrete bricks, steel columns, and glass facades. So how can we build with life? How can we scale complexity, tunability, and intelligence to match urban scales? How might they apply to archetypical building materials, such as concrete and geothermal foams? The digital construction platform is an experimental technology for large-scale digital manufacturing. In contrast to typical gantry-based construction technologies, robotic arm systems offer the promise of greater task flexibility, an ability to excavate, design and build with local materials, solar harvesting, and so much more. Our platform consists of a mobile five-axis hydraulic arm with a six-axis robotic arm mounted at its endpoint. Combined, the platform offers 11 degrees of freedom. You're looking at long exposure images highlighting the two arms in action. These two systems implementing a micro-macro manipulating robotic architecture akin to the biological model of the human shoulder and hand, where the large arm is used for gross positioning, while the small arm can perform fine positioning, provide oscillation compensation, and improve force control bandwidth. It can even act as a Geiger counter, detecting and measuring ionizing radiation. The arm system has a radial reach of more than 10 meters, and the system's track base provide mobility to the platform. 
To demonstrate the platform's ability to sense and scale, we designed and printed a dome, one of the most structurally stable forms. As our demo material, we used foam, which can expand 40 times volumetrically. Small amounts of this material enable building structures that are much larger than the footprint of the system. So here's the system, an autonomous, self-driving entity, controlled entirely on its own, armed with nearly 8,000 pounds of material, as it places the first layer of the print on the foundations. The 50-foot diameter dome with an open top was fabricated in just under 13.5 hours over two workdays, at which time it was, we believe, the world's largest continuous print on site, manufactured by a mobile printer. Looking forward to create a certifiable structure, this form could be filled with concrete and reinforcing metal elements utilizing the very same system with a custom end effector to place rebar. At the end of the mission, the system drives itself back to the hangar using a remote control button on an iPhone. Potential applications for the system include fabrication of non-standard architectural forms, incorporation of data gathered on-site in real-time into fabrication processes, improvements in construction efficiency, quality and safety, and exploration of autonomous construction systems for use in disaster relief, hazardous environments, and extraterrestrial terrain. Last year, the platform was acquired by NASA's Marshall Space Flight Center for purposes of remote construction on lunar and Marshall missions. By her 80s, my daughter Raika will be living on a planet that is four degrees warmer, with 11 billion people living on it with vast portions of it rendered uninhabitable for millions of climate refugees escaping storm and fire. Scientists predict that the sixth mass extinction will be well underway, causing irreversible damage to our planet. As master builders and authors of the Anthropomass, architects, the gardeners of tomorrow, will either make or break our bond with nature. The architectural practice of the future will not differentiate between atoms, bits, and genetic matter, nor will it discriminate against other species. Within it, we will fuse hardware, software, and wetware to create new kinds of structures that can respond, adapt, and evolve. This future is as complex and ethically charged as it is fascinating, as it is promising, Either way, it is the only way home. So take one more look at that pale blue dot that's still here, that's still home, that's still us. Our little Earth, the small stage in that vast cosmic arena. Now think about your children, your grandchildren, your cousins and nieces and nephews and consider a post-apocalyptic city placed within landscapes blasted by cataclysm that have begun to destroy most of civilization and, in the intervening years, almost all life on Earth. Why hurry to Mars while we can architect a future of synergy between humans and nature? Rather than being forced to abandon this precious planet, let us design our way back into it. Make nature your client, and you will be forever grateful.
Thank you.